Our call to worship is from Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 3. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. This morning, Mr. Joseph Wagner will introduce our first hymn. Our opening hymn this morning, number 274, Hail to the Brightness of Zion. Zion's Glad Morning, number 274, and we'll stand to sing.
Matthew chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2, and we'll read the first 12 verses, and you can follow along in the Pew Bible, beginning on page 1026, Matthew chapter 2, first verse. <clears throat> Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. <clears throat> After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. We continue our reading from the scriptures by turning to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, and I'll read the first 13 verses of the chapter, found on page 1,242, Ephesians 3. For this reason I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation. As I have written briefly, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things, so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. So I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Let's join to pray in the words of the collector from the Book of Common Prayer. 
O God, who by the leading of a star didst manifest thy only begotten Son to the Gentiles, mercifully grant that we, who know thee now by faith, may after this life have the fruition of thy glorious Godhead. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Adam's original sin, 
We have inherited that sin as ours. He acted on our behalf in the Garden of Eden. And so that sin is our sin because he is our head, head and representative. And so the original sin and the corruption that ensued from that sin is ours. We acknowledge that and we confess it before God. If we had been in that garden, we too might have acted in the same way. We not only are guilty of original sin, but also actual sin. The fact of our union with Adam and his sin is evident in our daily life, in our daily conduct. If you wish to prove that you, are, that you have no connection with Adam and his original sin, then don't sin. But you can't do that, can you? If you understand your heart and the nature of sin, you see that sin corrupts you through and through. So you've inherited Adam's rebellious heart. You've rested upon yourself and your own ways rather than trusting in God and serving Him. And so we are guilty of both original sin and actual sin, real sin, which we've committed personally, individually. And because of that sin, we are debtors to the justice of God. That is to say, we are accountable to God for what we have done. God, being just, must punish sin. And so therefore, our sins bring us before God's bar of justice. And He must, to be just, punish sin. And so we are debtors to that justice. We owe God something which we cannot pay. The Catechism reminds us that we cannot make the least satisfaction for that debt. We don't have any financial, moral uh, reserves that we can make use of to absolve that debt. No actions, no sufferings we undergo in this life can atone in the least for any of our sins, not even the slightest sin. All of your tears, all of your penances, all of your uh, sufferings cannot atone for your sin because your sin is a far greater uh, value than anything you can do to atone for it because you've sinned against God. So we cannot make the least satisfaction for that debt. We pray then for ourselves and others. Jesus reminds us that we shouldn't be so focused on ourselves that we only think of ourselves, but pray that others also be forgiven of their sins. Do you pray for your, your spouse? Do you pray for your children, your family members at large? Do you pray for your church, your community, your nation, that God would forgive us of our sins? It should be on our hearts that God would forgive us all. This forgiveness comes by God's free grace. Not anything that we deserve, but entirely free, if you will, arbitrarily. That is to say, God does not owe us forgiveness. Even simply by asking in, in the abstract, God does not owe us forgiveness. It is His free grace that grants us that forgiveness. He does so according to His own will, according to His own purposes. And so by that free grace, He does forgive us through the obedience and satisfaction of Christ. This is the great way, the foundation for any sense of forgiveness. Christ suffered and paid the satisfaction necessary for our sins. His obedience pleases the Father. And that is what stands for us before God. Christ's sufferings, Christ's righteousness, that's our only hope. And so on the basis of His work, we pray for forgiveness. Well, the... Catechism will continue on from there. We'll take that up next time, Lord willing, and consider the nature of faith in the reception of God's word of forgiveness. Our next hymn, number 430, I Lay My Sins on Jesus, Spotless Lamb of God, number 430, and we'll stand to sing. <laughs>
Acts chapter 4. In Acts chapter 4. And I'll read the uh, first 12 verses of the chapter. As they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, If we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Let's pray. We thank you, O Lord, for your word. We thank you for the message of Jesus and his great work of salvation. We pray that your spirit would bless that message this day, that it would abound in fruit for each of us, that we would uh, rejoice in this one who has brought us deliverance from sin and death and brought us everlasting life. We pray that you would help us to learn from the preaching of the gospel here of your great work on our behalf. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1932, William, uh, I'm forgetting this, William Ernest Hawking, I say that three times fast, William Ernest Hawking was a professor of philosophy at Harvard University, and he was commissioned by the Presbyterian Church of that day to review the mission work, the foreign mission work of the Presbyterian Church. And so he composed a report which he called Rethinking Missions. And in the course of that report, uh, he expressed the opinion that uh, Christianity was uh, the sum of what all other religions had hoped for. It was the fulfillment of all that they had hoped and dreamed. And so, in some respects, he's putting Christianity as part of the great uh, expressions of religion around the world. Not especially unique, except further advanced, perhaps. This study was funded by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., and it caught the attention of a conservative uh, professor from Westminster Seminary, now formerly of Princeton Seminary, by the name of J. Gresham Machen. Machen was uh, very upset by the approach of this report in the way that it had adopted a liberal perspective on missions. Christianity is no longer considered to be distinct, unique, the alone way of salvation. Uh, Machen argued the point in a dramatic fashion uh, against, uh, I believe it was Dr. Spear uh, from Princeton Seminary uh, in the Presbytery uh, um, they met in Trenton, New Jersey, and I'm not sure if it was the Presbytery of New Jersey or, or what, but in, in any case, they argued over the uh, 
religious nature of the report? Is there modernism in our church and shouldn't our foreign missions board be rejecting modernism and being sure that we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to the nations of the world? Somewhat to confirm Machen's point of view, Pearl S. Buck, whose homestead is just not far away from here, a few miles away. Pearl Buck, the novelist, went to China and she was a missionary on behalf of the Presbyterian Church. And she was one who viewed the, the old historic uh, understanding of Jesus as uh, past its time and we needed to embrace a new message about Jesus. So Machen stood up and opposed this influx of what he considered modernism, which is really not Christian faith, but a, a new kind of faith, a new kind of religion, a humanistic religion, seeking to push out Orthodox Christianity. You know something of what transpired after that in terms of the formation of uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church through Machen's efforts. Uh, but what you find is that there was tremendous hostility towards Machen and his point of view within the Presbyterian Church. They eventually brought charges against Machen and drove him out of the church. This is not the first time when religious leaders, those who are entrusted with the spiritual care of the people of God, were themselves blind and hostile to God's work in their midst. The first instance of that within the early Christian church comes to our attention here in Acts chapter 4. After Peter and John were used by the Lord Jesus to bring healing to a man who was lame, causing him to stand and leap and rejoice in God's work in his life, and the great crowds gathering together, immediately thereafter, they were dragged before the Sanhedrin. When you read Luke's account here, this would happen later in the day. At about 3 o'clock was the time of prayers. Probably another hour or so elapsed and the final offerings would be made at about 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So evening was coming in and a great crowd of excitement was building around Peter and Peter was preaching there and telling them of Jesus and the resurrection. And people were believing what they were hearing. Suddenly the... Uh, the priest came running into the area along with the, the temple guard and others of the Sadducees and they wanted to suppress all of this building excitement. They were concerned that any uh, uprising here would bring trouble upon them from the Romans. So they extricated Peter and John, put them in prison because it was too late that night to decide the matter. And they brought them before the Jewish Sanhedrin on the next day. Imagine that. You perform a great work of healing in a man's life. He's leaping, rejoicing, and praising God. And what happens to you next but you're thrown into prison? <laughs> Not what you might expect from doing a good deed. The Sadducees were behind all of this. The Sadducees were the rationalistic party there in Judea. They were anti-supernaturalistic in their point of view. They denied the resurrection. And when Peter began to proclaim the resurrection in Jesus, Peter was involved in a double fault. He was opposing their teaching, in fact, a triple fault, in that they objected to the very fact that Peter himself was preaching to others. What business did he have? going out and preaching and teaching within the temple. He was not authorized. He was not trained in the, the schools of the Jewish people. Who was he to preach? So that was one problem. And that will come up later in the course of the trial when they raise the question, uh, by what name or power did you do these things? When you look at it in Greek, it's by what name or power did these things you do you? <laughs> it's like, who are you to do this stuff? Like Galileans, fishermen. Why should anybody listen to you? And so the Sadducees were upset with that, but then further they spoke about the resurrection from the dead. That was something they did not believe. The resurrection was not possible. It's not rational. And then 
to tie that belief of the resurrection to Jesus, whom they just had crucified. And making him the source of the hope of resurrection. That was just too much for the Sadducees. And so they drag them in to the court. Now, this created quite a stir. You can see by Luke's account that this was no ordinary trial. It wasn't just one, one lone judge in a courtroom bringing Peter and John before them and asking, what do you do? Here's your sentence. No. This was the full Sanhedrin. All the chief priests, the high priest, and uh, the emeritus high priest, who Annas actually in Roman terms was the emeritus high priest, Caiaphas, the son-in-law, was in fact the, the official high priest, but the people recognized Annas still as the high priest, and so he still had authority there. And then there was John and Alexander. John was probably the, I believe the son of Annas. Remember Caiaphas, the son-in-law. And uh, Alexander we don't know anything about. But Luke records their presence there, the chief priests, the families, the, uh, the Sadducees, everybody who was somebody was there. Now, uh, to give you a visual of this, it's probably the case that they sat in kind of a semicircle like this. And they had Peter and John standing there in the middle before them to give an account for what had occurred. Now this was the same location where Peter, not more than a month or so earlier, had seen Jesus dragged in the course of the night, placed on trial, beaten, and then thrown off to Pilate to be crucified. And you recall that Peter, when he stood outside that Sanhedrin, was cowed by a little servant girl who said, surely you're one of his disciples. Now here is this very same Peter, not much, not many days thereafter, appearing in the same place. And you've got to think, he had memories of that night flooding his mind. This is where Jesus was crucified. What will happen to me? He's brought before that crowd. And he's in a new position now. Because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because of Pentecost. The outpouring of the Spirit. And now he and John appear before these men. And they are filled with the Holy Spirit. And with great boldness now and with such clarity, they stand before these men and make their defense. A couple things we can note before we get into Peter's defense. One is that you might question why God allows His people to suffer in these ways. Why is it that when Peter had a large crowd there in the temple and people were believing in Jesus there, such that Luke records that the, the, the growth of the church was such that it was now 5,000 men, not including women and children. And mind you, that's probably not saying that 5,000 men right there came to believe in Christ, but the whole number of the church at this point had grown to 5,000 men. Many of whom no doubt were added that very day. Why is it that God allowed Peter to be drawn from that place of harvest and of preaching and is now in prison and to appear before the Sanhedrin? God has His purposes for His people. And God would bring Peter before these men to give this testimony, which would be a record for you and I and for generations to follow, Peter, of who Jesus was and what He has done for us. God had a great purpose in mind here. God's kingdom will not be frustrated or stopped by the hostility of those who are in power. But His work will continue despite all of their efforts. And that will become apparent in the way that Jesus excuse, the way that Peter describes Jesus in his defense. Now let's note Peter's defense. First, he kind of uh, 
plays with the minds of the, 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 the synagogue here. They could not, the Sadducees in particular, could not bring themselves to say that a miracle was performed. They said, how did you do this? Here's this man standing before them. No doubt the, the man himself was there present as well as a witness. He's standing there walking in the very presence and they could not come to acknowledge the fact that a miracle had been performed, that the man was healed. They just said, how could you do this? And so Peter kind of draws it out for them so that they couldn't miss what happened. If you're asking how we uh, healed this crippled man and brought him this health which you now see as he's standing here before you, yes, a miracle was performed. A good deed was performed. And you are going to judge us for healing a man who is lame? Think about that for a moment. We're doing something good for this man, and you can't tolerate that? Where are your morals? Where is your compassion? So often hostility towards the church has no regard for the good that the church accomplishes in history and time but just is intent on destroying it. Don't confuse me with the facts. Sadducees could not acknowledge the fact that a miracle had been performed or would not freely do that in the presence of others. And so Peter draws out the effect of what had been done there. And then he goes on with, with great boldness, he says... Let it be known to you and to all Israel that by the name of Jesus this man stands before you healthy, healed. By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified and God raised from the dead. Here is boldness. Standing before the very Sanhedrin that crucified Jesus not many weeks ago, he says, you are the ones who have crucified God's Christ. Such boldness, clarity, and directness. Surely the words of Jesus run in Peter's mind that you will stand before kings and those who are in authority and do not be afraid about what you will say. Because the Spirit of God will give you words to say at that time. Peter, with great boldness, spoke directly before them and did not shy away, but clearly proclaimed Jesus Christ. Now, he offended them. He spoke against their sensibilities. They were upset about what he had to say. But he spoke the truth. To those who were rebellion against God. I'm reminded of something I read by Bishop John Shelby Sparm, who objects to the words of Peter and other Christians who say that the Christian faith presents to us a Jesus and a, a word of salvation which is unique and exclusive. It's only through Christ that you may be saved. And John Shelby Sparm says, that these words have been so horrific that many people have been harmed by these kinds of things, been told that they will go to hell if they don't repent and trust in Jesus. And so Spawn rejects all such language and says, you're offending and hurting people. <laughs> yeah, because they're sinners. We don't do it to hurt them, but to save them. Because they will perish unless they believe in this Jesus. Peter spoke directly and boldly to these people, urging them to repent. That the very one that they crucified was God's Christ. And God went against their purposes by raising him from the dead. Yes, Sadducees, raised from the dead. We are witnesses of that. 
And then Peter quotes a text from Psalm 118, which is also echoed in, echoed in Isaiah 28. A text that he heard from the lips of Jesus himself, where David in Psalm 118 notes how uh, the, the leaders of the day rejected this cornerstone. But God made it the, the cornerstone of his kingdom. The stone which the builders rejected was made the chief cornerstone. Now, I think the New International Version says capstone, which is kind of the, the topmost piece on which the arch of a, a main entryway uh, secures that entryway. But I think more than likely the idea is that of a cornerstone. And you recall back in the building of the temple, uh, Solomon in his day would have his workers. He hired thousands of uh, workers to go up into the, the mines and to cut these huge, massive stones. They cut them, dressed them, and then uh, wheeled them up to Jerusalem. And there when they arrived in Jerusalem, the builders would examine the rocks to see which ones, or the stones, which ones would be used in the construction of the temple. And one unique stone was necessary for the cornerstone. And here, the text says that their judgment was so poor that the stone that they rejected is not worth it being placed anywhere on the temple, was the very stone that would be forming the cornerstone of the temple. And the cornerstone would be the stone that would set the parameters of the building. Its angles had to be perfect. Its alignment had to be just right. It had to be such a solid stone that it had no cracks or no crevices, no forms for weakness. It was a solid, perfect stone. And it, placed, it was placed in the core because that's where everything would be joined together. And that day, everything hung on that cornerstone. The stone was weak. The whole thing would suffer decay and collapse. David says, God took the stone which was rejected, rejected by men, and he's speaking not so much of himself, but of the coming Christ. This one would become the cornerstone. This is God's doing. And we rejoice to look at it. And so Peter, before these Sanhedrin, quoted this text and applied it in their very presence. You are the builders of God's temple. But the very stone you rejected, Jesus, is the Christ whom God placed as the foundation of the church. All kinds of memories, I'm sure, went through Peter's mind. Jesus telling him, your, your name is Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Jesus is the rock. Faith in him is what builds his church. Have you rested your life on this very same rock, this cornerstone? Is everything about your life grounded in Him? Your righteousness secured in Him? Your life grounded in Him? Everything that you do focused on Jesus? Is He the cornerstone of your life? Peter would later on in his epistle, in 1 Peter chapter 2, talk about how we are living stones being built on Christ be a temple of God. We, the church, are the true temple. Christ being the cornerstone. We are built on this foundation. And he goes on to say, as he concludes his message, uh, that there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name among men uh, given by God by which we must be saved, but Jesus Christ. It is only in Jesus that salvation comes. And so Machen was right to stand up in his day and to say that our missionaries must support this message. There's only one gospel, only one way of salvation. Now our purpose in going to the nations of the world and the religions of the world is to call them to repentance, to turn away from their idols and to embrace Jesus and the salvation that he provides so that they might be saved. We must preach this gospel to all the nations of the earth. 
And if some folks are offended, then they're offended. Jesus himself would say, those who fall on this stone will be broken. That's hard. When we come to faith in Christ, we are broken. We are broken in terms of our confidence in ourselves, our confidence in our old ways. That must be broken. But if we fail to come to Christ, if we are unwilling to be broken before him and to receive God's forgiveness, Jesus says, but the stone which falls upon them will crush them. There's coming a day when this stone will crash many. Will you be broken today? Or will you be crushed in a future day? The message of the gospel is that there is salvation in this Jesus. And in no other name. Whether it's Mohammed, Buddha, Confucius, whether it's Moses, whether it's Sigmund Freud, I'm stretching. <laughs> Whatever name you seek salvation, it will not help you. Only Jesus, only his blood, only his righteousness, no other name, no other lamb, only Christ. Do you rest in him? Well, in conclusion, you never know what God might do for you. We look at Peter and his boldness and we wonder, how can I speak with such clarity and boldness in my day? When I am challenged to give testimony to my faith in Christ, how can I stand firm? And what will God do for me? We'll pick up the story for Peter later on next time, but I want to remind you of another story from missions of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and that is the story of Bruce Hunt who was imprisoned during World War II and was in Japan. And he was brought before a Japanese court to give account for his faith. He was preaching the gospel. And the Japanese court brought him and two other missionaries before them after being in prison for 40 days in a cramped, uh, disgusting place. They come out with Bruce Hunt had 40 days growth of beard on him. Maybe a Duck Dynasty kind of guy <laughs> at this point. A beard, uh, just stocking feet and, and dirty clothes. And he and his two missionary friends are standing before these Japanese officials in a major court. And they began interrogating. And they asked, they, they, they brought all kinds of charges against them. And Bruce Hunt says, I was trying to remember, some of the charges were... Nothing little, and he, he just passed them, but there were some major charges, and he was trying to remember them all, but they kept replacing one charge after another, and he couldn't remember them all. And, and then they began asking him questions. He started answering their questions. And the, the Japanese fellow surprised him at the front, and that he had a bunch of papers in front of him, I think filled with the charges against him, but he also had a Japanese translation of the Bible. And he began questioning him. And Bruce Hunt stood for that whole day, or for the morning, and then had a chair to sit in through the afternoon, but answered questions all day. Were you opposed to emperor worship? Yes, sir, we are. Do you hate the emperor? No, sir, we love him. We desire his salvation. That's why we preach salvation in Jesus Christ. Why do you not submit to the, to the state religion? Because there's only one way of salvation. Are you hostile to, to Japan? No. We have disobeyed the rulers. Well, we must obey God. You yourselves recognize that there's a, a right to obey in that you refuse the, the decisions of various other world courts. The question went on. At the end of the day, they had a half hour break and the judge reconvened. They stood before him to await their sentence. And the judge said, you're dismissed. And with that, they got up, turned around. Some of the justices up there at the court gave Bruce Hunt a, a wry kind of smile, and they looked at him and then walked out. And Hunt couldn't understand what happened. He turned to the Japanese interpreter who was there for them, who was interpreting in Korean, and he asked him what happened. They said, well, they found no charge against you. He said, what? 
You're free to go. And they left. In the course of that testimony, Bruce Hunt faithfully, carefully explained the scriptures, rooted all of his answers in scripture. It's an amazing story. At the end of the day, in spite of the great hostility that these judges had towards him, he was let go. God will give you wisdom to know what to say at the moment you need to say it. And who knows what God may do? Many Christians suffer and die. There are 70,000 Christians in North Korea in prison right now. 70,000 Christians in prison. Many for a lifetime. Not only them, but their grandchildren as well. Many, of course, die in those prisons. North Korea is considered the worst country for the persecution of Christians. You may die for your faith, but nonetheless give faithful testimony to Jesus Christ, grounded on Him as the cornerstone of the church and of salvation, and know that He is the resurrection and the life. Satan will not the gates of hell shall not prevail against Christ's church. He will build his church. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the experience of Peter and John before the Sanhedrin and for this opening uh, salvo from Satan himself trying to crush and intimidate your church. We thank you that Peter gave a faithful and true testimony and we pray that your same spirit would strengthen us, that we would give faithful and clear testimony to our generation of Jesus Christ as the only way of salvation. We pray it in his name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's word this morning by bringing before the Lord our morning times and offerings. <coughs>
thank you for your mercies to us in providing for our daily needs. We thank you for your love for your church. We pray that you would bless us as we give ourselves and these offerings to you, that you would cause them to abound to your glory and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. Let's turn to the Lord and confess to Him our sins and seek His forgiveness at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the ministry of your word in our midst, and we recognize that we fall far short of the full standard of righteousness that you reveal in that word. We do not love you as we ought, nor do we love each other the way we should. We pray, O oh God, that you would forgive us for our daily sins, our sins against each other and against you. Forgive us, Lord, for the sins of our hearts, the sins of our actions and our words, we pray, Lord, that you would cleanse us of them all, and wash away our guilt, and help us to fix our hearts and minds on Jesus and his great work. We ask for forgiveness in his name. Amen. The Lord promises to forgive in these words through the Apostle John, 1 John chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. As those in fellowship with God, depending upon our Heavenly Father for all good things, let's approach him in prayer and seek his provision for our earthly needs. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for this forgiveness that we have in Jesus. We thank you that in him, all of our sins are washed away, that we are made new, that we have your spirit to dwell within us, and we have your favor once more looking down upon us. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your truth and your goodness. We thank you for the ways in which you have provided for us in this past week. We thank you, O oh Lord, for bringing us together in your courts that we might approach you in prayer. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would provide your uh, blessing on us, that you would bring healing and help in our time of need. Uh, be with those who are elderly among us. We pray that you would sustain them in life, strengthen their souls, their faith, secure them in Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring them safely through uh, this, these times of weakness. We pray that your hand of healing would be on each one. We pray, Father, that you would be with, uh, uh, with Esther Baldwin. We thank you for... Uh, the renewed uh, health that has enabled her to come today. We pray that you continue to bring healing to her as she recovers from the shingles. We ask for your blessing on her and on the Baldwin family as they care for her. Father, we pray for other needs within our congregation that you would minister to them, comfort those who mourn. We pray that you would encourage each one. We pray that you would uh, Guide us in our paths that we might live before you in ways which are pleasing to you, prosperous in our work. We pray, Lord, that you would provide for our needs, for our homes and our families. We pray that you would defend us from evil within our community, protect us from acts of criminals and vandals. We pray, Lord, that you would protect our church and our property. We thank you for the way in which you watched over us for many years. We pray for your continued protection. We pray that you would bless the ministry of our church, that it would abound. We thank you for our Sunday school and pray that these would be times when we mature in our faith and grow in Christ. We pray for our teachers, that you would bless and encourage each one. Father, we pray for uh, our Wednesday uh, Bible study group. We pray that you would uh, cause that ministry to prosper and to grow. And we thank you for Dr. Adams' uh, work, and we pray that you would encourage our hearts through his efforts. Father, we pray that you would bless our, uh, our country. We pray that you provide for uh, your church within its midst, prosper her ministry, uh, give her wisdom to walk before you, and to give faithful testimony to Christ in our day. We pray that you would defend us against a, a government that is increasingly uh, oppressive and hostile to the work of your church. We pray, Lord, that you would overthrow those who are evil and uh, place... Uh, we place them with those who are just and right. We pray for the advance of the gospel in this country once more, that this nation will once more be a light on a hill for the nations of the earth. We pray, Lord, that you would bless the work of missions. We thank you for those who serve 
across the world. And we pray that you would bless them and their efforts, sustain them. We pray for the light of the gospel to shine throughout Europe once more, throughout Asia and Africa and South America. And Lord, we pray that you would do this for your glory and praise. We pray that you would overthrow the hostile powers in the Middle East that oppress your church. We pray for Christians in Egypt, in Libya, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Iran, and elsewhere, in Saudi Arabia. We pray, Lord, that you would defend them, protect them from evil, from harm. And we pray that you would break the power of those who would oppress your church. Enable your people to give faithful testimony to Christ. We pray that despite the hostility of the wicked, your gospel would flourish and abound throughout those countries. Father, we pray that you would uh, watch over our military and their service, bless our chaplains, and provide for their needs as well. We ask for your blessings on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Joseph will lead us in the last thing. Our final hymn, number 270, The Church's One Foundation is Jesus Christ, of course. Number 270, and we'll stand to sing.